Inflation is at a 40-year high and food prices are skyrocketing at a time when one in seven Americans are enrolled in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, known as SNAP. I've got a terrific panel of experts joining me now to talk about food insecurity and the toll it's taking on vulnerable populations. Radha Mutaya is the president and CEO of the Capital Area Food Bank right here in town, which partners with 450 nonprofit organizations in the D.C. area to, prov to provide food to those in need. Lauren Bauer is a fellow of the Economic Studies program at the Brookings Institution. We love Brookings, always come out to talk to us, so thank you. She conducts research on issues of economic and public concern, including the Federal Nutrition Assistance Program we just talked about called SNAP. And Pamela uh, Mishner is the co-director of the Center for Health Equity at Cornell University. Her research focuses on poverty, racial uh, inequality, and public policy. Thank you all so much for joining us. Jamila, let me just Start with the academic. I mean, I know that you can probably find academics at Brookings, et cetera, but you know, start with, with, with your work and, and ask you to go back to what Jim McGovern was talking about and, and what I learned from uh, Rashad Robinson in Color of Change. We can't depend on philanthropy to solve big, deep structural problems in society. So I would ask you, what does our audience need to understand by way of getting it, you know, what I would consider to be a tectonic shift in the way we approach food security and beginning to fixing something. Because when you go back and you're talking about George McGovern and Bob Dole decades ago, a conference in 1969, this seems like a kind of bleeding ulcer we've learned to tolerate. And I would love to know from you how we approach it and really fix it. Yeah, I think this uh, idea of some real structural transformations having to happen can be a surprise to people, honestly. And so that's the first place really to shift our, our thinking around these issues. It's really interesting. I, I teach a class on poverty and often when we start to, when I start to go over with students, sort of the state of affairs, how many people in what is a very rich and, and wealthy and well-off country um, are struggling to, to meet needs as basic as finding nutrition that's adequate for themselves and their families, there's always a bit of, but if you look hard enough, can't you find something to eat? Like this is America. Aren't there food banks? Aren't there pantries? Aren't there options? Aren't there government programs like supplemental nutrition assistance and uh, school lunch programs, et cetera? And of course the answer to all of those things is yes, but the, the answer is also that each of them um, is inadequate. And even when we put them all together as a hodgepodge, uh, the whole doesn't meet the needs that people have. And so I think that we need to um, really re-envision what it means to consider something like nutrition, uh, a basic right that everyone should have, and how should that be reflected in our public policy. Philanthropy is great, but it is uh, out of the control of public policy. It's difficult to evaluate, uh, and it's difficult to make sure that gaps and holes are being plugged when you're overly reliant on that mechanism. We have government programs that are supposed to be doing this, but you know, I've been for the last few months doing interviews with people who rely on SNAP benefits. Um, about their actual experiences with those programs. And it's amazing how many people I talk to who have supplemental nutrition assistance uh, wow. and who are still hungry and whose families are still hungry. And so the first thing I think is recognizing this is a real problem and the current approaches are not working. Shifting our thinking around uh, food and nutrition being something that everyone deserves no matter what their life station or situation looks like. And recognizing we can't get to other big goals, like we want people to be healthy. You can't have health without nutrition. We want people to be financially stable and work good jobs. You can't do that if you're not adequately nourished and able to have your basic needs met. Every other good thing we want in society requires having people have their basic needs, subsistence needs around things like food met. And coming to a consensus right. around those core principles is a big first step and recognizing that the next step is gonna require a cross the board change and transformation and not simply tweaking little things a little bit more right. for this program, a little bit more for that, but really rethinking the entire enterprise of meeting these needs. Thank you for that. Lauren, you know, listening to this, and I know this is an unfair question, but um, you're Brookings and you know everything there, right? So, uh, uh, and, and Jamila just, you know, helped lay out some really nice scaffolding on this. Are there any, uh, you know, I, I sort of am motivated sometimes when I read, oh, here are the, 
you know, 10 best inclusive cities in the country, here are the 10 worst. Are there 10 great stories out there in terms of addressing food insecurity at other levels than the federal level that we can celebrate and say, hey, here's a community that's beginning to tilt the right direction, get some of the things that are right. Should we be talking about those? Or, or is there nowhere yet? So I'm not really well qualified to answer that question, but uh, I think there are some things that are important about how federal nutrition assistance works in local mm. communities that are notable. Um, you know, you, you've led a lot with inflation and how much food costs and food costs different dollars in different I mean, let's places. just stop there for a second. Steak up 17 percent, peanut butter 15 and a half percent, chicken 10 percent, food 7 percent. I mean, those are the things I care about, but I'm sure that there are many other staples. I mean, I just got these numbers for you guys today. I mean, I'm a GIF addict. So, I mean, it's one of these things where you kind of look at, at how, how prices have changed so dramatically. If you're wealthy, you're fine. If you're not, you're, you're really put up against the wall. So I didn't mean to intervene, but I wanted to kind of make it real in terms of the, the dramatic no, that's right. I think this is all that. about purchasing power. Yeah. And what what the federal government has done over the past two years in response to the recession, specifically with nutrition assistance, but other things like unemployment insurance and the child tax credit, all of which have been putting downward pressure on food insecurity and providing mm. resources to purchase food. And the question that we're addressing here is how much worse would it have been without federal response? Answer, a lot worse. And mm. how much more do we need to do as a society, not just through public policy, but through all of the stakeholders uh, that Chair McGovern brought up that would be participating in um, a White House conference to bring hunger to zero in this country? Um, you know, one one of the most important things that has happened over the past year um, has been an increase of 21% of the maximum SNAP benefit level that incorporates for the first time, you know, actual purchasing power changes that are different from what it was in the 60s. And so in this moment, SNAP is a more effective program in terms of purchasing power to combat rising food prices than it has been in the entire history of the program. And so well, there are certainly issues, and I associate myself with, you know, administrative barriers and it not being enough. Um, but, you know, there's been some real positive movement in these programs over the past couple of years, bipartisan movement, movement to address real problems like the closing of schools and lack of access to prepared meals by creating new programs that have put out tens of billions of dollars for children to feed them. Um, and so I think all of that is what what is um, on, on the table when we talk about food prices, but also the federal policy response to the pandemic. Thank you. Um, Rod, I just can't imagine. I, I saved you, not for last year, this is a kind of conversation go all around the table, but, but I can't imagine what it is like to be you these last two years. Um, when I look at the scale of need, and my notes here say that you reach 600,000 people within the capital area, which is a staggering number. I mean, if you know the population, mean, it's a very, very big percentage um, of our local population work with more than 450 organizations. And then you get a COVID pandemic that comes on top of that, that, that I'm sure makes all sorts of interactions and levels com you know, complex. Can you, can you just share with us a little bit about how you're, you're achieving your goals in such a stressed out, uh, complicated, toxic time. Well, certainly, Steve. Um, you know, it's been uh, it's been uh, quite the ride over the last couple of years for our clients who are in need, who are hungry and food insecure, and certainly for organizations like ours across the country who have been trying to increase um, uh, the the amount of food that we provide and constantly changing our operating models given supply chain challenges and and the rest. Um, so you're right. At the height of the pandemic a 50% increase in need in the greater Washington area. Um, and so um, something Chair McGovern said earlier, inequities have existed prior to the pandemic. They were huge. Um, they've just been exacerbated even more during the course of this pandemic. Now, the 50% increase is already a staggering number. But let me say that more than 80% of the newly food insecure continued to be minorities, uh, African Americans, Hispanic. And so this is is sort of a double punch, if you will, in terms of not just elevated levels of need, but impacting those who have already been impacted by disparities and inequities um, before. The other thing that we're seeing now is the inflation. We've been talking about this quite a bit. And so when you've got the, you know, 
increases in food prices, and for that matter, prices of other items. You mentioned some of the statistics earlier, 10 to 30% increases. The food line item is the first line item in a family's budget that gets cut when the situation gets tight. You can't cut what you pay in rent, you can't cut back your travel expenses, um, and you can't cut back medical expenses. So food is the line item that ends up being cut. And so you end up seeing people eat less or eat less nutrient rich foods that tend to be more expensive. And so that has the ripple effect of health consequences as well. What we're seeing as a food bank is therefore more people come to us in asking for more produce, asking for more protein, frozen protein, any type of meat, fish, et cetera. Those are the items that are more expensive. And so we are having to purchase a lot more of those items because that's what's in demand. And we're very focused, as are so many food banks across the country, in ensuring that there is an adequate diet and nutritional intake of our clients. So having the right proportion of fruits, vegetables, proteins, dairy, et cetera, is important. And so for us now, it means just purchasing tens of hundreds of truckloads worth of produce and uh, and protein to meet the need that we're seeing in the community. You know, after this, and uh, I, I've mentioned already, I, I have a, a, a discussion I've already had with Congresswoman Jackie Walorski, who is a Republican uh, from Indiana, but she makes the point that there are lots of regulations in place that inhibit the movement of food, um, I, I guess it basically contributes to food waste, that, that there are restaurants, there are food producers, there are farms that can't uh, easily move um, food to programs like yours um, and, and to the many, into the big network that you have. Um, what is your view on that, Rada? Do we need to kind of begin looking at how we cre create greater fungibility, if you will, in, in um, food assets so they can move? Would that be helpful? Absolutely. So we need to think about the food system as a whole and not just, you know, one part of that extended food supply chain. And we saw this work well, actually, during the pandemic. In the beginning, it was challenging. But, you know, once the first few months were over, we saw that we could actually get all the great yield from farms across our country and have those transported um, to food banks across the country to be able to support those um, in need. And so when we look at the system in its entirety, Priority. There are lots of ways to make that more efficient, to minimize waste, to get the right food to the right communities at the right time. Um, so that is absolutely something that we should look at. The other thing I would bring up is USDA relaxed many regulations around various food programs during the course of the pandemic. Uh, TFAP, which is the Emergency Food Assistance Program, um, had many of the pre-pandemic regulations of, you know, checking different forms of ID, filling out a questionnaire, things like that were relaxed because we had to be socially distant. We, we wouldn't be able to get that information. But as a result, and I think it was said earlier, uh, perhaps by Lauren, you know, as a result, you know, we were able to get more food to more people in need without all of this paperwork, if I can just put it that way. And that really helped keep the food security numbers higher than what they would have been if we had to uh, adhere to the other types of regulations. So we would advocate for the loosening of regulations that have been in place during the pandemic to continue going forward, because it, it, all it does is it allows us to get food to those who are hungry, plain and simple, right. without many barriers um, in between. And I think as was mentioned earlier with SNAP, again, there were many regulations that were loosened, um, and we would advocate extending SNAP to include many other groups that currently don't qualify. Um, I think Congressman McGovern talked earlier about veterans and active duty uh, personnel whose housing costs are included and right now don't make them eligible. They're college students who are not eligible and they should be because there's a real crisis of food insecurity on college campuses as well. Mm -hmm. And there's not policy efforts, but a lot that the private sector can do to enable this diversity of their hiring pipelines uh, so that we can achieve multiple goals um, at the same time. If they also provide benefits that are meaningful to allow people to, to stay and work. Um, and in the nonprofit sector, it was mentioned earlier, but mm. we have to look at our clients holistically. Right. We provide food, but how can we also uh, bundle that with health care? Right 
and education and skill development. So people right. don't stay in a state of poverty, but get to a state of greater sustainability. Great. Real, thank you for that. Real quick, Jamila, you know, I'd be interested in you know, your work of, of looking at the hard choices that people make you know, that are, that are living at poverty levels, and sometimes it's a choice between medicines, and you find you know, medicines, foods, other rent, as we were discussing, but it contributes essentially to America's epidemic of chronic conditions you know, in many ways that people are experiencing. And I guess this is, I, I don't mean to be facetious, folks, but I remember there being an article um, on the cover of The Atlantic years ago, and it had a big old Big Mac on the front of the cover and said, if we're going to basically deal with nutrition, we have to find a way to ally and turn snack companies and fast food companies into allies. And because, you know, when I look at the choices, you kind of go to places that are so-called food deserts and high quality food isn't available. What is available is junk food. And so I'm in, interested in whether or not there's an opportunity there that we are beginning to exploit, haven't exploited, whether they've made some progress. What's the situation on that front, Jamila? I think to, to the extent that um, that there can be partnerships, whether those partnerships are, are with the private sector or what have you, that allow people to have access to food that is more tr nutritious, like that, that's certainly not a bad thing. Although I would caution against relying too much on that. I mean, at the end of the day, um, the goal of, you know, food companies or companies that sell food stuff is uh, to make a profit. And if they can do that and also provide people with nutritious food, fine. Um, but if there is a conflict between health and nutrition and profit, it, it isn't clear and we haven't seen good evidence that health and nutrition went out. The benefit of, of the, the government, federal, state, and local governments as an arbiter in this space and as a prime actor in this space is that they can focus solely on getting people what is actually good for them in terms of access to a wide range of foods, um, the ability to be able to reach those foods, whether it's via transportation or what have you, and the resources to be able to afford those foods, right? And so when we think about what Rada said, what is it that people want and need and demand? It's produce, it's protein. Um, people are very much aware of the trade-offs between mm. um, good food that's nutritious for them and their pocketbooks and the ability to stay in your home. and do the other things that you need to live, um, but they but they don't have sufficient choices. Right. I think part of the role that the government can play is amplifying those choices for people right. so that they can do the things that are healthy and mm -hmm. giving them resources to support healthy choices um, and, and sometimes giving them access in ways that they don't have. And if that can happen through partnerships uh, with the private sector, fine, but I don't think we wait for the private sector to, out of the goodness of their hearts, want to do what's best uh, for people's health when there are industries that are billions and billions of dollars worth of profits that they're making year over year uh, that have nothing to do with providing people with access to nutritious food on a regular and sustainable basis. Interesting. Lauren Bauer, let me, um, again, I don't know if this is uh you know, the right way to go about this. But, you know, in the SNAP programs, I remember doing a, having a really interesting conversation with former Republican Congressman Will Hurd of San Antonio and Joaquin Castro, who's a Democratic congressman, you know, from sort of the same area, about SNAP. And they're both supportive of SNAP in the middle of COVID. But you got this sense of, an, I mean, I, I, again, this is my view, uninformed, I apologize, but kind of inefficient, kind of like not reaching some people where it was, you know, well-meaning. And they said, we need to create greater efficiencies. We need to look at things like debit cards and find other ways to create a greater nimbleness within SNAP and get over this antiquated way in which we were approaching reaching children in need in schools. And I'm just wondering, during COVID, has the stress of COVID created any evolution in the way we think of SNAP, distribute SNAP? Do we have electric, electronic cards and, you know, a digital approach to this? Um, or not, I'd just love to get an update on that. Yes, there's certainly been a tremendous amount of innovation um, and deregulation to allow greater innovation in the SNAP program over mm. the course of the pandemic. You know, we've been using debit cards for years, but now um, many states have been allowing um, 
uh, participants to, um, you know, use, you know, the same grocery delivery services that I use um, in order to, to get meals. And so there's been a lot of loosening of those rules to the benefit of participants. Um, in terms of school meals, you know, we did see uh, a new program stood up, Pandemic EBT, which um, put additional resources on existing SNAP cards for families with kids and distributed new cards to, um, to children who are eligible for free or reduced price meals who don't participate in SNAP in order to purchase uh, groceries at the grocery store. Uh, to my mind, the evidence is very clear uh -huh. that just giving families resources to purchase food at grocery stores enables choice, it utilizes the free market, and it provides that public support that not only reduces food insecurity in the household, but these dollars are stimulative. They put money into local economies that generate more economic activity. And a dollar in SNAP is one of the best federal dollars you can spend to slingshot a recovery. Well, look, I really appreciate all of you sharing your thoughts with us. This is a great conversation, the kind of conversation at least I feel like we don't have enough uh, uh, in, in policy circles. Maybe all of you are, you know, part of that community of people very concerned, but I think it's important uh, for those of us that aren't living this day to day to get, you know, inroads into, into what's happening. Uh, Rada Mutai, you must have the toughest job in Washington, the president and CEO of the Capital Area Food Bank. So uh, blown away by what you have been doing the last two years. Thank you so much for joining us. Lauren Bauer, fellow of the economic studies, uh, fellow of economic studies at the Brookings Institution and smartest person I know on SNAP. Now, and Jamila Mishner, the uh, co-director at the Center for Health Equity at Cornell University. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Happiness.